Hello, and welcome to this Introduction to Carbon Footprinting, presented by E3 Solutions. In today's presentation, we will examine general definitions of climate change and greenhouse gases, explore how climate change can affect your business, provide the basics for measuring a carbon footprint, and finally, provide you with the steps to get started in creating your first carbon footprint report. But first, what is climate change? At a general level, climate change is a significant and prolonged change in weather patterns. When we say significant and prolonged, we mean that the change is not something subtle, such as sun one day and rain the next, nor is it something that occurs only in a very narrow window, such as a single extreme weather event such as a hurricane, or a week-long period of clouds. Rather, we are referring to measurable changes in weather trends that occur over a period of many years. The causes of climate change can vary. Causes can include variability in ocean temperature, eccentricities in Earth's orbit, increased solar flare activity, increased volcanic activity, changes in plate tectonics, and finally, global warming. So what is global warming? A general definition of global warming is a rise in the average temperature of the Earth. Average is the key word here. Not all areas of the Earth increase in temperature as a result of global warming. In fact, certain areas will show a decrease in temperature. However, taking into account the rise and falls in temperature trends over the entire Earth's surface, the average trend shows a rise in temperature. And this is what we refer to as global warming. Causes of global warming vary as well. Global warming can be caused by the release of gases from the Earth, which go into the atmosphere and contribute to the greenhouse effect, which we'll discuss in a moment. The Earth also has a natural climate cycle that occurs over many, many thousands of years. Animal and vegetation waste and decay also contribute to global warming since there is a release of greenhouse gases upon the decay of these materials. Vegetation combustion, or in layman's terms, forest fires, also release large amounts of carbon dioxide into the atmosphere. And finally, the greenhouse effect. The greenhouse effect is the absorption of heat from the Earth by atmospheric gases that re-radiated in all directions, including back towards the Earth. Notice that the heat comes from the Earth in this case, not directly from the Sun. What happens is, heat energy from the Sun passes in its entirety through the Earth's atmosphere to strike the Earth. Energy that is not stored in the Earth itself is radiated back up towards the atmosphere. Now, gases in the atmosphere called greenhouse gases will absorb this heat energy and re-radiate it in all directions. So, some of this heat will be re-radiated back out into space. However, some of it will also be radiated back towards the Earth. This heat then becomes trapped. In generic terms, the causes are a rise in greenhouse gas emissions and a loss of greenhouse gas absorptions. In more specific terms, greenhouse gas emissions can occur as a result of fossil fuel combustion, leaks in refrigeration, animal and vegetable sources, and the emission of landfill gases. More often than not, a loss of greenhouse gas absorbers is caused by deforestation. So what are the greenhouse gases? The Kyoto Protocol identifies six gases or groups of gases as contributing to climate change. The most well-known one is carbon dioxide, hence the term carbon footprint. Next are methane and nitrous oxide. After that are 
hydrofluorocarbons and perfluorocarbons, HFCs and PFCs. Note that these last two are not individual gases, but rather groups of gases. Gases within each of these groups can have varying effects on global warming. And finally, sulfur hexafluoride. So how can climate change affect you and your business? Let's examine one common effect of climate change, extreme weather. Extreme weather can be an increase in tornado activity or an increase in hurricanes in a given area. An increase in extreme weather can have immediate effects on a region including loss of life, property damage, disruption of business, disease, and travel dangers. Consider the relatively recent Hurricane Katrina and its effects on New Orleans. Now how does this affect your business? If you have a business which operates in one of these areas, you may be forced to temporarily shut down, which can lead to a disruption of your revenue stream. Furthermore, areas which experience extreme weather with increasing frequency will likely see an increase in insurance premiums. Furthermore, are the reconstruction expenses themselves. If your business depends a great deal on business travel to or through such areas, you may experience decreased mobility of your sales or executive team. And finally, governments will likely increase foreign aid spending to these areas, which will mean an increase in taxation, which will have an indif indirect effect on corporations. At a more specific level, climate change can affect a number of different groups, all relating back to your own business. It can affect governments in the form of increased taxation to generate the revenue necessary to mitigate some of the damage, as we've already discussed on the previous slide. Disruptions in your business can affect the value of your shares if you are a uh, publicly held company and can affect the uh, revenue back to owners if you're privately held. Your employees can also be affected. Increases in incidence of disease due to uh, extreme weather, as we've discussed, can lead to uh, increased sick days, which turns into, again, lost productivity and revenue for you. Manufacturers on whom you may depend for products and services you need to run your own business can also be affected. So even if you don't necessarily operate in an affected area, one of your suppliers or one of your customers may. It can also affect the retail customer as well, especially if you are in an industry such as tourism where you depend on your customers visiting a specific location. In short, climate change affects you. So what can you do about global warming and climate change? Well, one of the first things you can do is measure your carbon footprint. To measure your carbon footprint, you need to know the sources of greenhouse gas emissions for your organization. A source is an activity that impacts the organization's operations and results in the emission of greenhouse gases. Some examples are listed below. Now, you're probably thinking that some of these sources aren't really under you or your company's control. Therefore, is it really fair that you be held completely accountable for these emissions? In order to deal with this, international standards such as ISO 14064 have developed different categories or scopes under which greenhouse gas emission sources are classified. The first, scope 1 emissions, deal with direct energy sources. These are any source activities from an asset controlled by the organization or facility. Examples of this would be natural gas that is burned on site to produce heat. Scope 2 emissions are indirect energy sources. Source activities that are not controlled by the organization or the facility, but that generate energy that is used by that organization or facility. The most common example is electricity purchased from a local utility. Scope 3 emissions are basically other sources that do not fall under the first two categories. 
these are non-energy related source activities that are not controlled by the organization or facility but that impact the organization or facility in some way. Examples of this would be employees commuting to and from work using their own personal vehicles or business travel on commercial airlines. To properly understand scopes, let's look at a few examples. In the first example, a company leases an office in a small building. The building has no central air, so the manager installs a small window AC to cool the office. The unit leaks a small amount of refrigerant. Is this refrigerant leak an example of scope 1, scope 2, or scope 3? If you answered scope 1, you're correct. The refrigerants are being leaked on site as a result of an activity that is occurring on site. Therefore, these emissions are scope 1. In the next example, a condo heats its units with electric baseboard heating. Electricity is provided by the city utility. Is this an example of scope 1, scope 2, or scope 3? This is an example of scope 2 emissions, indirect energy. The energy is being produced off-site at the city utility, and emissions are being generated at that point. However, the energy resulting from those emissions is being used by the condo. In the next example, a small community garden decides to establish a compost heap on the property, decomposing organic waste emit substantial quantities of methane. Is this scope 1, scope 2, or scope 3? Because the methane is being emitted by an asset of the community garden, this is an example of scope 1 emissions. In the next example, a large organization decides to track employee commuting to and from work across all its locations. It has each employee fill out an online survey about their commuting habits. It finds that 10% carpool, 10% bike or walk, 25% take the bus, and the rest come in by car. These are examples of scope 3 emissions. The assets are not owned by the company, but they impact the organization. In this final example, a new office building using state-of-the-art technology harvests electricity from a rooftop solar array during the day and stores the energy in batteries. It also draws in heat from the ground through a geothermal unit. Once, during an extended power outage, the building's backup diesel generator was activated to make up for the shortfall in electricity. Is this generator an example of scope 1, scope 2, or scope 3 emissions? The correct answer is scope 1. Diesel is being burned by the organization at the site itself.